thing about music, when it hits you, you feel no pain. There's some truth to that. The truth to that is one good thing about music is that when it hits Bob Marley, he feels no pain. But he doesn't know what everybody else experiences. This is how we measure pain, right? It's like something like this. <laughs> <laughs> Today I'm going to be talking about the experience of pain. I'll tell you a little bit about the research and then how you as doctors can help not take away the pain of your patients, but experience it with them and help them to experience their pain. The British Journal of Anesthesiology had a study, tons of studies, but the one in particular that I'm choosing to talk about shows that there is no proportion between pain and amount of tissue damage. You can have pain that is proportionate with tissue damage. If I came up to Kate with pliers and yanked the tooth out, it would hurt. If I took another set and ripped another one out, it would probably hurt twice as bad. But you can also have pain with no damage. Headaches, back pain, angina, you can also have no pain, but have a ton of damage. 40% of patients with myocardial ischema don't feel any pain. You can also have pain that is distal to damage or in an amputated leg. So how are you going to explain that with a comfort? In the Journal of Pain in 1996, they showed that people who sit back passively, and this is something that is painful for me, because I've been in pain for six weeks now, and it's not significantly debilitating pain, which I didn't even realize was affecting me until something I'll get to later in the talk, until this week, how much it was affecting me because I was passively going through. People who passively see their pain, but don't actively search out solutions, increase distress, increased emotional stress, increased disability, increased cost of healthcare, which was also proven by a guy named McCracken, awesome name, 1991, he showed that people who are hypersensitive to their pain or over vigilant with their pain also experience increased emotional stress, increased disability, increased cost of health care. I've seen five doctors now. I've felt a little bit better here, not so much there, sometimes a little worse. But every time I've gone, it's like, okay, I'm going to go see this doctor. I'm stoked. I'm going to feel so much better. And I walk out, and I'm like, okay, I feel better now, right? I try to do a squat, and it doesn't work. And it's really frustrating. So then I say, oh, man, I just got to sit back and relax and not do that again. Okay. But that's not what right. There's a model called... myself and that has been shown in the literature as well. Back pain and stimulus happens. 
next step, and a separate step, is the experience of the pain. Once you get to the experience of the pain, you have, some would consider a choice, some don't see it that way. But there's two roads to take. In that experience, you either feel fear or no fear. If you feel the fear, which can be linked to the function of pain, either the presence and identification of the stimulus causing damage, or the potential threat, which is linked. So if you choose the fear route and identify with the threat, the threat, the potential for more pain, more damage, or the first initial damage, you go that route, you will now have adverse effects in your life, avoiding such, such activities and sources of stress, sources of pain, that will take you back over, and I'm, you guys aren't seeing it, but I'm actually standing on a piece of paper walking through my flowchart. <laughs> okay, so now you're over in the experience again. Back to make that choice once again. How did that avoidance work? You went and saw a doctor, you went and got care, you're back in your experience. If you're not comfortable with the pain, and you're not in the active mode of pursuing solutions, you may still be afraid. And you stay in this zone. It's not until you can connect with your pain, understand the pain, and realize that there is ways you can deal with it and still live a functional life. You're not just disabled. You have tons of abilities still. But so many of us tell people, oh, now you're disabled. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. You can't do this. But we forget to tell them you can still do all of this. And so people can feel alone and they can feel afraid and stuck on this side of the flowchart until finally they can accept it, not be afraid anymore, and come here for resolution, for function, living their life. So as doctors, thinking about this, there's three things you can do. You can empathize first and foremost. You can educate and you can empower them. First and foremost, like I said, is empathy. Don't just try to come in and fix a problem. There's two problems with that. Number one, you're not connecting with the person. And number two, you're putting them in that passive role of receiving care, which has been proven in literature, that that's gonna increase distress, increase emotional stress, increase disability. So connect with the person, come in, understand what's happening before you make any moves. Once you completely connect with them and help them to connect with themselves, now you can come into the education component. You've done your evaluation, you've, you understand what's going on, this is where we do our own homework. Before we start flooding them with information, we connect, and then based on what connection we have, where they are, what they're experiencing, what they're ready for, what their past experience is, all of that together, what are their needs, is what education and information you're going to give them meet their needs. Maybe someone doesn't want to know what the hell's wrong with them. They just want you to fix them. And you talking to them is the same thing everyone else has done that they've seen. Maybe that person doesn't want that. Maybe that person wants you to give them a full 20 page report on everything that you've found and everything because otherwise they're going to go to someone else. Find out what that person's needs are and educate them to that point. The last is empowerment. When they leave your office, it shouldn't be, oh great, my care is finished, and now I'm going to go back to the life that I've been living that led me to this office. But empower them to realize you are not just a disabled person in pain, chronic pain, emotionally distressed, helpless. You have the ability to do so much you connect and connect them with other people that are experiencing similar things depending on their disability. But primarily, pain is an experience. And it's not something that's going to go away. We all experience pain. And so as you send your patient back out into the world after connecting with them, after educating them, empower that person to stay with themselves, to stay connected, One good thing about music, when it hits you, you feel no.